This session is about how to study the Bible. And I'm glad you have an interest in studying the Bible. But I, I always like to give a disclaimer such as this to begin a session like this. It's important to say that the study of the Bible, that knowing the Bible, does not comprehend the entire Christian life. There's more to the Christian life than studying the Bible. You want to know how I know that? Because the Bible tells me that. The Bible tells me that prayer is an important part of the Christian life. That uh, evangelism is an important part of the Christian life. That getting together with the fellow people of God, you know, just sharing the community, encouraging one another, loving one another, all that. I mean, I, I could go on. Worship is an important part of the Christian life. And it is possible for a, a, a believer to kind of get so focused on the study of the Bible that they think that a Bible study comprehends everything in the Christian life. And I just want to make sure that's not true. And the reason we know it's not true is because the Bible itself tells us that's not true. That, that person's problem who believes that, it isn't that they study the Bible too much. They don't study it enough, or at least understand it enough. They say, oh, I need to spend time in prayer. I need to spend time in worship. I need to spend time sharing my life with other believers. So I, I always like to give that disclaimer, even though I, I feel pretty confident in kind of my own credentials, if you want to say that, as a Bible guy. I mean, I, I'm very focused on the Word of God. And for me, my study of the Scriptures, both my personal study and even study uh, to prepare to preach and teach, for me, it's a beautiful time of fellowship with God. That's how I like to explain it. I love spending time in God's word because Jesus Christ meets me in his word. And it's a little hard to explain. And I'm not trying to say that every time I open the Bible, I have this transcendent, I'm carried off into the third heaven kind of experience. But I'll just say that, that very often I have very intense fellowship with Jesus Christ in and through his word. And that's, to me, that's, that's kind of the, the sweetness, the fruit of the word of God and the, the study of his word. If we want to do some preliminary questions, I, I just kind of want to hear some feedback from you all. Uh, one great question is, what Bible translation should I use? Who, who wants to suggest a good Bible translation, something that you use in your personal study of the word? The New Living Translation, NLT. Raise your hand if you have used with any kind of regular basis NLT. You can raise it up. Let me see. Don't be ashamed. All right? That, that, I, I think the NLT is a good translation. Now, I don't think there's any perfect translation, but everything I've really looked at in the NLT has been solid. I think, man, that, that's good. Uh, any other? ESV. Okay, raise your hand if you're an ESV. Okay, yeah, lots of those too. And when I say that you're that, I'm just saying you've spent appreciable time there. Um, any others? New King James. Raise your hand if you spent some time in the New King James. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the translation I predominantly use. Most, I, I'll be very honest with you. Oh, yes, I do like it. Yes, I do prefer it. But also... Look, I got a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the entire Bible that's been online for more than 25 years through the New King James. I'm, that's the horse I'm riding. It's just, that's it. That's, that's, it. It's too late to change horses. So, I mean, I do read other Bible translations, and I am kind of itching to teach verse-by-verse -verse through a book with the NLT. I'm kind of looking for a time and excuse to do that just to see what it would be like. Anyway, any others? NIV? King James? CSV? Okay. OCSB? NASB? Okay. Any other ones? I, I hope, 
I hope nobody's saying uh, the Passion Translation. Well, again, I, I want you to know, I'm really not big on telling people not to read books. I think that just draws more attention to them. Somebody tells me not to read a book, what do I want? I want to read that book. So I'm, I'm not saying that, but I, if you're going to read the Passion Translate, you should read it as a curiosity. D don't read it as a Bible. Read it as a curiosity. Um, okay, so, but that's an important thing. And I often recommend to people, if, you, if their Bible reading time has become stale, maybe you want to change a translation. I also want to say this. Any of you people who are serious about Bible study um, and, and serious about preaching and teaching, I do recommend to you that you read the King James Bible from Genesis to Revelation at least once. And I'll tell you why. Because for hundreds of years, that's been the dominant translation in the Christian world. And there's a lot of references to the King James Bible that you'll come across in different commentaries, Bible dictionaries, sermons. And you, if you're serious about preaching and teaching and study the Bible for that, you need to be familiar with the King James, with its vocabulary, with how it phrases things. Because otherwise, you'll be reading these other works and you won't know when they're referencing Scripture, when they're just putting out words of Scripture. So that's, that's something I always recommend to people. Now, how about this? When in the day should I study my Bible? If you guys have regular habits, how many of you are regular morning studiers of the Bible? Okay, good. Those are the righteous ones. <laughs> how many of you are uh, evening studiers of the Bible? Okay, that's a good amount too. Uh, any like midday, after, you know, or noon, lunchtime, whatever it is, studiers? And then, how many of you have, okay, honestly, you do spend time for Bible study. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. That's not your habit. But it, it's just all over the place in the day as to when you do it. Any of those? Yeah, a few of those. Okay, got it. Um, should I study my Bible by myself or with others? And, and look, when I talk about with others, I'm talking about like, this would be like a Bible discussion group. Not just like a teacher, but you kind of read the Bible together. Are any of you involved in a group where you can like read the Bible together? Yeah? Okay, for those people who do it, is that like helpful? Do you, do you dig that? Do you like it? Yeah? That's good? I, 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 I don't know. It, it's been a long time since I've been involved in a group like that, but that's, that's something you can do, and I think that's a valid thing to do. Get together with some people and just read the book. Okay, you read the next four verses, and then you can just kind of talk about it as you go through. Groups like that can be very fruitful. Um, okay, here's one. Should I study my Bible from a screen or from a physical book? Okay, who, let's, let's raise a hand from the physical book people right here. Oh, wow, look at you. The righteous in the land. <laughs> Okay, now let, 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 let me explain a little something here. Um, I often, all right, more honest than I want to be here. I often recommend to people that they read the Bible from a physical book, even though I often, more often than a physical book, I'm reading the Bible from a screen. But here's the, the, the point, here's the difference. What I want, and, and if I don't mind, if I could be like the old man here in the room, which I kind of am, to say to your generation, what's really important is that you don't treat the Bible like you read other things from your screen. You see, there's something that goes on with your screen intake. And what is it? You scroll through it quickly. You scan and scroll. Right? That's just how it is. That's how you handle your social media feed. That's how you handle the Google search. You search for something on Google. What do you do? You just scan the first few results and you think you're an expert just because you scan it. That's just how it is. And, and I'm not saying that's all bad. There's benefit to scan and scroll. But that's no way to read your Bible. So I think one of the big benefits for your generation especially 
to use a physical Bible is it helps you to realize this is not scan and scroll. I read this differently than I'm going to read my social media feed. Because if you're trying to scan and scroll through the Bible, and your brain is being trained to do that. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to train your brain to shift gears when you come to the Bible. Because you're just not going to, you're not going to receive much with a scan and, scan and scroll habit or mentality in reading the scriptures. But I'm, I'm encouraged to hear all the, uh, uh, okay, as, as a preacher, uh, it, there would be something amazingly beautiful when I would say, uh, okay, turn in your Bibles to, and then you would hear the sound of rustling pages. That, we need to just replicate that sound and get it, like, played through the room when the, when the preacher says that. Because that's an awesome sound, and you just don't hear it as much anymore. Um, and then, of course, a great question to ask is, are there helps or study guides or commentaries that I should use? Uh, anything you guys find in particular helpful? Well, yeah, you're just saying that. That's just kissing up to the teacher. That's it. Other things that you find helpful? Bible project stuff? Okay. Blue Letter Bible. Tremendous resource, Blue Letter Bible. Chuck Smith commentary? Okay. Audio or written? Written. Okay. Pardon me, one more time. John MacArthur's Bible. Okay, again, audio or written? Okay, written. Do you, do you use that online or in a physical book? Okay, physical Bible. Okay. A parallel Bible. That's what that's called. Those are helpful. Those can be helpful. Okay, anything else? Yes. Bible dictionary is helpful. Yes. You see, you're talking about things that like are old school that we would have just in books that we'd use a lot. A lot of times now people just Google that information. But when you run across things that you don't understand or a place you don't know about, you run across it, you can look it up. It's helpful to use those resources. Okay, anybody else want to say something else about a resource? Right, to get into, okay, and I, I would strongly recommend Blue Letter Bible for their Greek and Hebrew resources. Tremendous Greek and Hebrew resources to be found on Blue Letter Bible. Okay, that, that's a little, w one more. Okay, that's really good because reading the Bible in different languages, if you're capable of doing that, can be really helpful. It can give you insight into just different words and ideas and, and bring things to you in a fresh way. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. I, I know a little bit of German, and I, I'll read through a simple Bible translation in German, and sometimes it's very edifying. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that one of the most important things you can gain in your study of the Bible is the ability to simply observe, to see what's there. You're not trying to create something that's not there. You're just simply trying to see what's there in the biblical text. And this is something that you can train your mind to do. The, the classical inductive Bible study framework is observation, interpretation, and application. Or you can phrase it with three different words, to see, to know, and to do. Every Bible text in front of you <coughs> gives you something to see, to perceive, to receive, to understand. Every Bible text in front of you gives you something to know, that is to believe and to trust. And then every Bible text gives you something to do, to live, to act out. So keep those words in mind as you read your Bible. See, know, and do. And it's easy to say, say, I'm going to read my Bible until I have something to see, something to know, and something to do. 
If you journal along with your Bible study, it's a great way to do it. Okay, in my reading today, what did I see? What do I know? What do I do from today's Bible reading? But the order of that is very important. There's often something within us that says, okay, just give me something to do. But in the Christian life, doing is very important, but it's based on what you know, and what you know is based on what you see. So see means that to know and to do comes from the text. To know means that this is more than information, it's something to believe. And to do is essential because we can't only be hearers, but we need to be also doers. So let's talk just really for a few minutes about how we can be better, better seers, observers, when we come to the biblical text. This is an ability that you can train yourself to do. Now, one of the most brilliant expositors uh, in this regard that I've ever read or spent a lot of time with is Charles Spurgeon. You know, if you take a look at Charles Spurgeon's sermons, I think maybe about one-third of them, and that's just an approximate guess, about one-third of Spurgeon's sermons were where basically he used the text as a launching point, and he would just launch off into something, and it, it's great. But then maybe two-thirds of his messages, and again, I'm just throwing that out as an approximation, maybe about two-thirds of his sermons where he breaks down the text word by word, thought by thought, piece by piece, and he just observes so much in it. And, and I'd like to think that like, one of the things that helped me to be able to see the text better was just noticing how he saw and observed. And say, well, I, I can do the same thing if I train myself to do it. So let's see if we can train ourselves just right now in a way to do that right now. Uh, could you take that off screen? Okay, what was on that picture behind me? Bibles. How many? What were the Bibles doing? What was their situation? Were, were they all Bibles? How many of them were Bibles? Two of them were Bibles? Two of them were Bibles? Four? Three? What? Are, are we agreed that they were not all Bibles? Okay, what were the books that were not a Bible? Paraphrase? There was a Bible? The one that was a paraphrase was a Bible. Okay. Well, what, what were the books that were not a Bible? A dictionary? Okay. Um, what were the Bible translations that were up there? All right. What, what was the condition of the books on the shelves? Old? Were they all old? Were they all old? Hardback or paperback? Paperback. What colors were they? How many times did the word Bible appear on that screen? How about how many times did the phrase Holy Bible appear on the screen? Once? I like that phrase, Holy Bible. I had a friend once, he, you know, he's a totally secular guy. He gets saved, like he has no background in Christianity at all. He gets saved and he knows he needs a Bible, so he walks into a Bible bookstore. There was a time when they had Bible bookstores. And uh, he says, I need a Bible. He talks to the clerk, I need a Bible. And, and the clerk says, well, what kind do you want? You know, he's thinking, what and the guy says, Holy. <laughs> That's awesome, isn't it? Give me one of them holy Bibles. I don't want any of their kind. All right. Um, let's do this. I'm going to time this. At my command, we're going to put that, that picture back up. And I'm going to give you one minute to write down 
as much information as you can observe on that screen. As much detail as you can think of. You're observing as much detail. Okay? One minute. Put it up there for one minute, and then we're going to see how much. Ready, set, go. All right. How many books were on that shelf? How, how many of them were Bibles? Uh, were, at least marked as Bibles. Four? Okay. How many books had no visible title? What were the translations? All right, I'm going to take it. You guys got it. I couldn't understand any of that. Um, how many of them looked like they were in new condition, or roughly? Okay. Um, how many would you describe as being slightly worn? How many with significant wear? Okay. How many were black? One. How many red? Uh, how many kind of black brown? It's, some of this is subjective, right? Exactly what the color is. H how many green? Yeah. All right, all right. This next one's important. You got to hang with me on this one. How many of them were red letter editions? How many were red letter editions? Put that back up. Okay, okay. Red letter edition. What's this? Words of Christ. Why would it, what does it say below that? In red. Boom. I knew it was two. Okay, take it down. Take it down. We got to can't do this. How many times does the word Bible appear? How many, how many times does the phrase Holy Bible appear? It's four. Put it back up. Holy Bible, Holy Bible, Holy Bible. Oh. Dictionary of the... Okay, now look, look, look. Here's just one I want to show. This is very instructive. Now, all of you guys did good when you sat down to say, I'm going to look to observe. But isn't it true that, that there's some details that are easy to miss? It, and it's not that they're not there, but it's easy to miss. That dictionary of the Holy Bible was easy to miss because it's not on a Bible. The words of Christ in red is easy to miss because it's just the beginning of the phrase. But this is what I want you to understand. This is really helpful, I think. Every one of you can Lift your observation game significantly just by putting effort into it. Just by sitting down with your Bible and not reading it in drone mode. 
We kind of do that, don't we? Uh, what did you just read? I don't know. Okay, now look, I, I would rather you do that than not read the Bible at all. I would. There's probably some people say they wouldn't. But I would rather you do that than not read the Bible at all. But don't be surprised if your Bible reading seems unsatisfying and boring if that's how you're doing it. But when you sit down and say, I'm going to pay attention to the words, just, just by giving it focus and attention, you can lift your observation game significantly. But even after that significant bump, you can lift it significantly more just by training. Just by saying, okay, I'm going to look at it again and see what it says. It's very satisfying as a Bible teacher to be able to walk people through a scripture and show them things that are in there from 2,000 years ago, but they never noticed. And it's not anything new. It's just new to them. So you can train your powers of observation when you read the Bible. Now, some of this is also just by before you open your Bible, praying, Lord, help me to see. Help me to see wonderful things in your word. Help me to observe what's there in the text. And again, don't feel bad if later on you found out there was something that you didn't see. This isn't like a game where somebody wins and loses, although we've kind of played it almost like that. But, but you understand, you, you shouldn't feel guilty. You, you should rejoice. Oh man, I saw four amazing things in those verses and then a guy just showed me two more. That's even more amazing. That, that's how you should feel about it. But if you'll just give your attention to observation, ask yourself the questions. Okay, here's a series of questions to ask yourself. Who's speaking in the Bible text? Not necessarily just who's writing, but who's speaking. For example, who wrote the book of Job? We don't know. Could have been Job. I'd probably say he was the leading candidate, but there's a few other suggestions. But the bottom line is we really don't know. But throughout the book of Job, it's helpful to know who is speaking. Uh, when you run across the verse, curse God and die in the book of Job, it's helpful to know who said that. Was that the Lord saying that to Job? Or was that somebody else? So knowing who's speaking, when you read something, makes all the difference. Who's speaking? Who is being spoken to? Now, sometimes there's something in God's word that is not directly for you, but in application, it's for you. Let me give you a great example uh, that great verse, Jeremiah 29, is it 11? Yeah. You know, that refrigerator magnet verse. Uh, I have a future and a hope for you. How's that verse go? Says the Lord. Okay. Is that verse written for you? No. Who was it written for? For Israel. Uh, for Israel in exile, God telling them that they would bring them back and reestablish them in the land. Okay, so in a sense, that verse isn't for you, but does it apply to you? Absolutely. Because here's the principle. The same God who made that promise to Israel is the same God that you pray to and that sent Jesus Christ and is represented to us in Jesus Christ. And that God has not become more selfish in the new covenant, he's become more giving. So if God made that generous promise and generous heart towards Israel under the old covenant, how much more will he do it for his people under the new covenant? But you understand that promise wasn't given to me directly, but the way it shows God to me, that God is for me today. It's a beautiful thing. 
Um, you take a look at the text and you can ask yourself, is this history? Is this poetry? Is this prophecy? Friends, you need to understand, the Bible is a collection of books written together. And we need to understand the Bible literally, that is, according to its literary um, genre, if I could use that phrase. I think I said it in my message before, when the Bible speaks history, it's true history. When the Bible speaks poetry, it's true poetry. I should have this verse memorized, but I don't because I use this illustration so often. But in the Psalms, David says, I made my bed swim with my tears. Now, was David speaking literally there? Well, y yes and no. He wasn't speaking like historically literally. Can you imagine that? He cried so much that it flooded his room and his bed was floating on his tears. Okay, he wasn't speaking, but was he speaking poetically literally? Absolutely. And everybody can relate to that. We're like, yes, we know he's, you, you felt like you were drowning in your tears on your bed. Okay, we get it completely. So it's literal, but according to its literary genre. So history, poetry, prophecy. You look at a verse and you ask yourself, what are the prominent words? What are the repeated words in a text? If you look at two or three verses and faith is repeated four or five times in those verses, hey, little alarm bell right there. Faith is important in these verses. Okay, so how do I understand that? It's good to look for if there's any one word that helps organize the others. Therefore, because of, thereunto, or, or just any prominent word in the verse that helps organize the others. Um, I, I like, especially when I'm, when I'm uh, reading the Bible, to, to let it be like a movie in my head. Uh, this is made a little bit more complicated today. I, I don't know in a good, I honestly don't know in a good way or in a bad way by things like uh, the, the Chosen. Um, chosen, good or bad, well, look, I, I encourage people to, to kind of let it be like a movie in your head when you're reading about Jesus interacting with somebody. It's something that really happened you can really think of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus at night and having that conversation and imagining the scene there. I think that's a totally legitimate thing. Um, if there's anything that I'm not too stoked on about The Chosen, it's that it has so much extra biblical content in there. Just so much that isn't from the Bible at all. It's not necessarily against what the Bible says. I, I, I want to buy the rights to The Chosen and reissue it with a, 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 a green light at the top right hand of the screen, or a green or red light, and it'll flash red when it's something that's not in the Bible, and every time it's something that's in the Bible, I want it to flash green, just so that everybody can understand this is really in the Bible, this isn't. Um, but I, I think it's okay to, to, you know, construct in your mind, this is what actually happened here in this. Um, you look at the verses and you ask, is there a promise in this verse? Is there a command in this verse? Is there a warning in this verse? Is there a statement of fact in this verse? Is there an encouragement in this verse? It's worthy to look at a verse and ask, uh, is it for the past, for the present, or for the future? You, you can ask yourself, okay, if, if there's something to do in this verse, what will happen if somebody does this? Um, what will happen if somebody does not do it? Um, what, what does this verse give me to apply? Now, there's a phrasing that we use when we talk about this with the Bible. And I don't want to be too tough on the phrasing because I'm generally okay with the idea behind the phrasing, but I'm not into the phrase itself. 
Let me explain what I mean. It's the phrase, what does this say to you? Or what does this, even worse, what does this mean to you? When we read something from the Bible and say, well, what does this mean to you? We kind of act like it could have a different meaning to everybody. But look, the Bible has one meaning in a verse or a, a section, but it can have many applications. And oftentimes when people say, what does this say to you or what does this mean to you? What they're actually saying is, how does this apply to you? And that's okay. That's okay to, to ask that question. How does this apply? Because it can have almost infinite applications, but there's really one meaning of the verse. And then there's something to do, and that is to record something of your observations. Something that I recommend to people do, I, I recommend it to people over and over. I, I got to be honest, I, I'm not confident that there's ever been a person who's actually followed my recommendation here. Maybe there has. I've said it to a lot of people. I think surely there's some people who have done this, but I don't know. I'm going to keep throwing it out because it's been very helpful for me. Read through the Bible. Genesis, Revelation, or I, and you can start with the New Testament or whatever. Read through the Bible and write a one-sentence summary of every chapter. One sentence. One sentence summary of what the chapter says. That will make you pay attention as you're reading the chapter. Okay, I've got to come up with a one-sentence summary of this chapter. Now, I've got a couple of notebooks filled at home. And they're really cool to have with one-sentence summaries of me reading through every book of the Bible. Friends, I think that is something that will focus your Bible reading time in a marvelous, wonderful way and just keep you from being in drone mode as you read through the Bible. All right, there's a lot more that I could say. Uh, we've got five minutes left. Let me just open it up to some questions, whatever questions people might have for the next five minutes. You raise your hand. Uh, yes. Where is the best place to start? I would say that that depends on a person's current biblical knowledge. If someone's pretty new to the Bible and to the scriptures, then I would say start at Matthew. Start with the New Testament and just start going through. If somebody uh, has been a believer a while and they're pretty familiar with the Bible, then I'd say start with Genesis and just go through. Uh, other questions? Oh, hand, yes. Well, you just have to be open to being convinced by better evidence. So if somebody can show me from the Bible that I'm wrong about something, I'm open to it. Look, my, my thing is I want to get the Bible right. I want to understand it correctly. And uh, th there's things that you say, oh, well, wait a minute. I, I used to understand this, but maybe there was a bunch of, and I I'll use kind of data from the Bible that I was leaving out of the calculation here. I need to incorporate that data into my understanding of this principle, and, and that, that's going to change it some. So if somebody can bring to me, it's not going to be new things from the Bible, but things that I had overlooked, or that, then I'm, I'm open to hear it. That, that, that's how I would, I would understand that. And, and that's just approaching the text humbly, realizing that it's possible for me to be mistaken or wrong about something. But if I'm wrong, I'm open to that but you're going to have to show me I'm wrong from the scriptures, not from something else. Okay, other questions? Yes. Okay, well, uh, the use of a commentary or a Bible teacher can help you do that. Um, look, I, I, I met a guy, I don't know, within the last few weeks. He told me that he uses my commentary all the time, and he uses it with his daily Bible reading. And this is what he does. He says, I read the chapter, I think about it, and then I read your commentary. And you know, that, that's just kind of a good exercise to do. Um, read a chapter, 
write down a bunch of observations or, or a section, and then maybe read the work of somebody else and see what they have observed, see what that. And, and some of it will be really confirming, oh man, this is great. Uh, I noticed the same thing they did. Uh, some of it may be, oh wow, I, I didn't see this. I, I'm happy to know this as well. And some of it may be, um, I think that that commentator missed this. I'm, it's so cool that I was able to see this or, or understand that, which is awesome as well. Yes. Well, you can't put your full trust in any Bible commentator. And if you read something and disagree with a commentary, that's fine. N nobody should think, oh, this guy's got a commentary, he must be right. But the commentator, just like any Bible teacher, they have to make their case from the scriptures. If they're not making their case from the scriptures, then you don't really need to regard it. So, I mean, it doesn't come to mind immediately. I mean, there's always wackos out there. But, of uh, 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 people, but, yeah, I mean, I think you, you just can't lay down, so to speak, before a Bible commentator and say, oh, well, he must be right and I must be wrong. No, may, maybe you're right and the Bible commentator's wrong. Um, look, I, I read, of course, I mean, I have this commentary on the whole Bible, but I read a lot of Bible commentators, and there's a lot of them, guys I really respect. I go, well, look, I really respect you, Adam Clark, but on this point, I don't agree. And that's okay. And that, so, and it doesn't bother me if somebody disagrees with me on something. They're wrong, of course, but it doesn't bother me. <laughs> okay, uh, yes. Sometimes the application is more in knowing and believing. So, so sometimes it, it, it's easy if the application is, okay, I need to go out and be honest and tell the truth. Okay, that, that's good. That's a good application, that. But um, the applications that lead us to think differently, that's application as well. And I think people have a hard time finding application in the biblical text uh, it's because of that. They're not applying it also to how they should think. Um, so I need to apply this, and the way that I thought about this, I have to change that way of thinking and think differently about it. When, when we realize that application applies to our thinking as well as our actions, I think that opens up a much broader avenue for that. Okay, it, it is 12. We, we should wrap up. We, do we got a heart? One more question. All right, who's had their hand up the longest? I don't know. Come on, just somebody. Yeah, yeah. No, no, well, no, I, I think you just, oh, I'm going to go to this gentleman over here. Sorry. Sorry, I, I, I don't know how to pick. You guys can come up and talk and ask me these questions afterwards. That's fine. Okay, yes, one more question. Yes, yes, you. Not the person behind you, you. Well, a lot of what you're saying applies to what the particular issue is because some particular positions or issues require a really deep dive. And if you say, okay, I got to get some answers to this, then you just got to prepare yourself to do a deep dive on something. Other things are more simply answered and such, but I, I think what you need to do is read things that probably approach an issue from a few different perspectives and then say which one of them handles the biblical data best divides it rightly, and is most comprehensive in its understanding of the biblical. Most wrong teachings take a verse or two and sort of use them to cancel out other verses or other principles in the scripture. And that's not a valid way to, to understand the Bible. We don't believe, uh, well, except for a few things that do specifically say we're canceling out, uh, when when. God told Peter um, about the bringing in of Gentiles into the church. That was also God's very clear thing. I'm not going to require kosher dietary restrictions of my people under the new covenant. And so in a sense, that was a canceling out, but that's a very clear uh, explanation of that. W without that kind of clarity, we don't use, we just don't X out inconvenient verses. 
we find ways to incorporate them in our understanding of the entire thing. So sometimes um, I'll just read things from three or four different perspectives and kind of have to say which one of these really deals with the biblical data the best. But on some issues, that's going to require a, a, a deeper dive. 